And we're live. Welcome back to the Social Kick Podcast. I'm Brian Lundquist, joined by a full crew today, Luke Paddington, Dr. John Mullen, Justin Nguyen, and a special guest today, my college teammate, Olympian, multiple-time medalist, world champion, the wonderful Margaret Holzer. Margaret, thanks for being here. Of course, Ooh, thank you. <laughs> Dang. Uh, so, Margaret, uh, joining us live from Seattle while the rest of us are in bunkers in uh, the Bay Area <laughs> of California. Uh, what what type of varieties do they have up there for, for your glass tonight in the area of Seattle? Um, well, I am drinking wine, so that's what I'm doing. And, um, yeah, just, just hanging out. I have a, a good stock in my house, so I haven't had to venture out too much. Nice. Are you part of any wine clubs? Not at the moment. No. Um, but I should be, that's something I, I absolutely should invest in. This is like well, the right time. Yeah. My brother-in-law is uh, works at a winery just north of Seattle, uh, Santos Saint Michel, and he's becoming a winemaker. So if you oh, maybe we'll, we'll connect after this, and we'll see what we can do for you. I oh. have been there. Fantastic! Oh, I would nice. love a hookup there. Nice. Yeah, right, they I'll have really you. fun summer concerts too. All canceled, but next summer. <laughs> next summer. Well, right, exactly. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> Not meditation. Just a lot of just a lot of wine by mail this summer. Um, Luke, what are yeah. you drinking tonight? I'm drinking a Chick Fil A lemonade with some Angostura bitter. Chick Fil A. Chick Fil A. You get a big gallon of Chick Fil A lemonade, and I. Did. There you go. That's nice, John. Right. Are you drinking a Shirley Temple? What do you have? I'm drinking some Scotch from Johnny Walker Black tonight. That's Ooh. the John that I know. Justin, what are you drinking tonight? Well, just. Going back to good old water, one of my college friends, he makes a like it's like a boba kind of cup. And there's another cap that had a straw, but I'm just using it for water. Shout out to my friend JM who makes this. Oh, there you go. Nice plug. There you uh, go. <laughs> so I am drinking a Sierra Nevada Electropical Juicy IPA uh, tonight. Juicy. Uh -huh. Juicy. Juicy. I suppose when they say juicy, it's supposed to mean kind of uh I, I suppose citrusy, but I don't know. I'm not picking up that vibe. Anyway, it's not bad. Um, so, uh, Margaret, we wanted to take a, a step back in time and kick this off with uh, a, a point early in your swimming career and ask you, what was happening here? Sorry, what was, oh, what was happening there? Oh, wow. What is happening there? Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Sorry about that. Sorry about Where that. Where that picture? That's fantastic. Um, okay, those yes, are man. those Sorry. are. <laughs> That's I'm so that impressed right now. My mind is blown. Yes. Um, those are those are coconuts and um, oh my gosh, what is the drink you drink in, in the coconut fruity Pina drink? Colada? Thank you. That's like a real pina colada. Um, I was in Brazil. I have a virgin pina colada because I am 15 in that picture. <laughs> and uh, I was at a World Cup in Rio de Janeiro. And wow. um, we literally went to um, like the Shake Shack area. And there were pina coladas there where they, they took a coconut, cut a triangle in it, and then they just either poured what is it, rum or tequila, whatever it is that goes in a pina colada, and that was your alcoholic version, or your non-alcoholic version was just the, the coconut, and that was all of us on the um, the trip, and you can see Demeray Christensen is in that picture with me, she was on that World Cup, that's when I first met Demeray. Um, wow, I don't even think I have a picture, I'm gonna have to, you guys are going to have to give me a copy of that picture. <laughs> Justin, bring up another one. We so 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 Margaret, we're good friends of somebody on that trip of yours. Okay. Um, I was speaking to her today. She 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 I coached of her and she her brother swims of us and stuff. Uh, Marissa Watts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh wow. So Marissa was was talking highly about you and how um, what a beautiful swimmer you were even as a young swimmer. 
Yeah. Oh, that was really you'll, nice. You'll learn about Luke. He he can deep dive some social media <laughs> and some stalking. That's what I'm learning. He's pulling photos from all all sort of the place on people. Yeah, I am so impressed. That was a really fun trip. Um, I had that was my second time out of the country. I had been on. I was on the national junior team. Um, and I went out of the country, and our trip was in Sheffield, England. And yeah. then, um, I think from that trip, I got you know ranked in the world not very well, but I, you know, I think I was like, you know, 90th or something. And, uh, because I had a world ranking, um, I think you just had to be in the top 100. You were allowed to apply to be, uh, to go to world cup trips. And, um, at the time they, you could like rank them. And so I tried to pick the trip that I thought nobody, like all the good people wouldn't go on. Cause I was like, okay, these are the ones I think all the really fast rules will go to. And so I was like, okay, maybe, maybe this one, no one will go on. And then, I'll, you know, I'll get selected to go to. And so, um, I, I picked right, apparently, and I, I got to go to one, which was really, really neat. What's it like looking back at this now, after 15 years of traveling the world, just going all over the world, traveling, and this is one of your first, you know, your second meet. What's it like looking back and what happened after this in your journey? Crazy. Uh, it, was, it was so great. Um, that was the first meet I, I ever signed my very first autograph, which was awesome. Oh. And uh, I, I was a total nobody, right? Like, I, I you know, I was not fast at that point. So that was just really cool. But I think they were just asking everybody, but I, I didn't care. I just thought it was the neatest thing ever. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was actually the only time I ever raced in South America. So uh, in all of my traveling, you know, I raced a lot of places in the world, but um, that was my only competition in South America. So that was still to this day, really neat. I'd love to go back. I wonder, is that, what, are autographs a thing anymore? I mean, I feel like since selfies started, that that's all anyone does anymore. They want to take a picture with so yeah, like, I don't know. <laughs> when I was at 2017 World Champs with Sun Yang, I signed a few autographs because I was in the hotel wearing all my China gear and people would come up to me and they'd be like, oh, when is Sun Yang coming out? And I'm like, I don't know, but he doesn't want to talk to you here. He's in his hotel just trying to relax. And they're like, can you sign this? I'm like, I'm nobody. And they're like, you're the white guy with the Chinese team. You must be important. And I'm like, what? So so okay. I would just sign it, and then they would still hang out for like ten more hours trying to get an autograph from Sun Yong because they much they cared much more about him or Shu Jai Yu <laughs> or whoever. But I signed a few autographs, and so they still did it in 2017. That's awesome. That's awesome. So I have two story, and I so uh, and nowhere got to a famous level within swimming at all, and I. Uh, have gotten since I moved to California. I started my job, and within the first year there, which is three years post swimming career, I would I got letters on multiple occasions at my working place with a guy from the Norwegian Olympic Committee who said that he wanted my autograph, <laughs> and I would have pictures of me from World Champs and saying like eight little tear off like you know let me. Like you would tear off a, on like a college bulletin board for like a spare apartment. <laughs> it was like find this little sliver eight times. Oh my god! Uh, <laughs> the world are weird. I think my favorite ever to that point was on. Uh, I I think because because same thing. I would get things in the mail and you just sign them and mail them back or whatever. And I had signed like an index card and it was on eBay. Um, for like five dollars, and I was like, "Oh my god, someone's selling my autograph!" Like, I don't care if it's only five dollars. I was like, "That is the coolest thing!" You're I like, finally made it. You just bid a hundred secretly, and then you start selling your own stuff. Be like, "This last one, oh my god, hundred on an index card." I know. Two I just that was so cool. I was like, "No one is ever going to buy that," but that's amazing. <laughs> that it's <laughs> Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. Well, Luke and I are big Warriors fans, and I've never autographed anything. But a few years ago, Clay Thompson. I think my favorite story for from Clay is he had to autograph a toaster oven, and that everyone said that was like the good luck choice or good luck <laughs> item for the whole year to win the championship. That's awesome. <laughs> How important was that to you, Margaret, when you're at meets? Because I'm I'm sure you stuck around after Grand Prix meets and stuff, and you had to sign for your your sponsors, you had to sign for young kids and stuff. Talk about how the, how how was important was that for you know being a, a role model for these young these young kids when you were swimming. You were a pretty famous swimmer. So. <laughs> I loved doing that, to be yeah, honest. Great. Um, I I mean, obviously, starting at 15 um was my first time doing it, but I I thought that was 
by far one of the coolest things when I was swimming. Yeah. Um, Cause it's not like I was famous in real life, right? Like it's not like being Michael Phelps where you walk down the street and people know you on a regular basis. You're doing this maybe once a month. Um, and, and so I just always thought it was really cool and uh, really flattering if, if people knew who I was. Yeah. So um, especially as a girl, you know, your hair is wet and people are always like surprised I have blonde hair or that it's curly. <laughs> so if anyone could recognize me at all, I was just impressed. And um, so I, I loved doing that. And being a role model was something that was very important to me. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So we started off on a, a World Cup trip as a 15 year old, but I but I want to fast forward a little bit, but still rewind for you. What do you remember about your last swimming race? <laughs> um, mostly that I was glad to be done. Um, <laughs> to be <honest>. sure <laughs> um, <that. laughs> yeah, yeah. I I was I was definitely ready. Um, and my retirement I think was a little interesting because I you know, I swam in 2008 and then I wasn't sure if I was going to continue swimming or not. So I took four months off after the Olympics. Um, and, and ultimately I wasn't, because I wasn't sure that told me that I needed to keep swimming because I kind of always had this philosophy that like, I'll know when it's time. And because I was still kind of on the fence about it, I was like, okay, that I'm clearly, I don't know. So I should go. Um, and then sort of the summer of 2010, um, I got to a point where I, I, I knew, I knew concretely and it, um, it, it didn't have anything so much to do with swimming so much as it was, I just was excited to see what the next step was. And, and I didn't know what it was. <laughs> like, it wasn't like I was excited about something else. I just was excited to, I think, find out what the something else was. Um, but I was, it was like, you know, five or six weeks out of nationals and you can't stop you know, when you're like a month out of nationals. So I was like, all right, well, you know, I'm just going to swim through nationals. Um, if I make pan packs, great. I'll swim through pan packs. Um, that was clearly not the right mindset to make pan packs. So I obviously didn't make pan, pan packs. Um, and I swam my race in prelims. I went really, really slow. I didn't make finals. I knew I wasn't going to make finals in the middle of the race. And I, I finished and I just was like, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. You know, and I, I went and told Sean, he was my coach at the time. And I was like, I'm, I'm happy. Like, <laughs> I don't, I don't need to swim it again tonight. You know, like I'm, I'm good. So yeah. Did you warm down? No. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. I, well, I'm trying to think actually I might've because I don't remember if I did, if I did, it was only because I knew that I wasn't going to be able to walk from the lactic acid. Cause I, you know, I swam slow, but it, I was still really tired. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I might have. I might have actually, from that standpoint. Glenn Mills told a story of when he's. He, you can tell when you can. You can tell when two swimmers are in a warm down pool uh, have are done. Have done their career. They have a look on their face, and he talks about these two swimmers who were just sitting on the you know warm down pool like this, and they're just talking. And you can tell they was just over. It was a look about them as opposed to any other look. You know, I wonder if yeah. It's, it's interesting you said that. Just give up. Yeah, like, I'm done. yeah. I, just, yeah. It, 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 I, I definitely like. I, absolutely, I would agree with that. It, I, I saw George at Rio, and I, and that was his last race, the the, the heats of the, of the 53, and I came out and expected to hug him and console him, and he said that just just there, happy, just. Mm -hmm. And you know, is that look as well? It's, it's it's something that comes over you, right? When you realize that's it, we're good. Weird, yeah. Exactly. And like, I, I wasn't upset that I didn't make pan packs. I wasn't even upset that I like didn't make, you know, finals, even though I should have probably been embarrassed. <laughs> I just, I honestly was just like, I'm, I'm going to go have a really nice dinner and probably have a beer. And awesome. I'm like, I'm good. Like I, I, I just, I was very ready at that point. And I, and I think that was, it had been a slow conclusion kind of over two years of getting to that point. Um, but it had always been really important to me to concretely know, like, I didn't want to be in that position where I retired and then I came back and I retired. And I, I just, I had always kind of told myself, like, when I, when I do get to that point, I want to make a decision. I want it to be final and I, I want to be happy in my decision. And so that was kind of where in 2008, because I didn't know, I was like, all right, I'm going to keep doing it until I, I am sure. Yeah. Awesome. Did <laughs> You said that you didn't know what was coming next. Um, and I, I think we're going to get a little bit into that later, but I want to focus some on 
what <clears throat> was going on in your swimming career and kind of what led to that success because you I mean so we showed we started this off talking about a world cup meet and you were top 100 in the world at that point at 15 and then that was a, a you spent a long period of time at the high end of the sport the made the big team in 2003 multiple olympic games you're like at an elite level of world swimming for quite a substantial number of years what what do you think it was that you did well <laughs> um i'm abnormally stubborn <laughs> in the in, in the athletic world um, coaches, that. <laughs> coaches coaches like to flower it up and make it sound pretty by by calling it determination um but determination is is really just being stubborn and i think that's a quality that all elite athletes share and have in common um but what it really boils down to is it's it's being i think too stubborn to quit when maybe you should sometimes or or I think sometimes when other people do so um yes I did have a lot of successes but I also had a lot of failures and a lot of um difficult times that I think a lot of people would have given up on and um I just like I said I kind of would put my head to the grindstone and just like I'm going to get through this. And it's not even that I even realized that that's what I was doing. Like I said, I just sort of, there's the stubbornness to me that I think sometimes won't allow myself to quit. And then um, when it's over, it always looks really pretty and easy and, you know, whatever. Um, But I actually had a four year plateau from the time I was 14 to 18, where I didn't improve at all in any event. Um, So you know, when I was 15, yes, I was, you know, it, it, I made World Cups and things like that. But uh, when I was recruited to Auburn, um, when I went to Olympic trials, my first Olympic trials at 17, all of those times um, I had gone at 14. So I was being recruited to Auburn off of times that I had gone three and a half years before. And uh, a lot of the colleges honestly weren't interested in me. In me. Uh, Georgia told me I could walk on. Um, nobody west of Texas recruited me at all. Like they wouldn't even have a conversation with me. And, and I get it. Right. Cause at that point I was, I was, they all thought I was done and washed up. Cause I, you know, was swimming three and a half year old times. And I was, I wasn't getting slower. I just was consistent. And then uh, the same thing happened again um, from t- after 2003 worlds, I had a three and a half year plateau in the 200 backstroke. So the, the good thing there was that I continued to improve in other events, just not in my best event. Um, so I, I think I had some some difficult things like that, um, which would have been really easy to, to give up. But um, like I said, I, I am very, very stubborn and just kind of kept at it. And then eventually, you know, came out the other side and things worked out, luckily. <laughs> well, so what do you think it was, though, that so you have those plateaus, but then you still broke a world record and were an Olympic medalist and on the Olympic team. And so how do you go from those plateaus to the drops that you made? Like, what was it on multiple occasions? What do you think it was that led to the breakout of that? Maybe it's not even a pump, but you're just in a plateau. And a lot of people go through that. What, is it different either either time? What was it? Um, I think ultimately, so the thing about plateaus, it's funny is you don't realize you're on them in the beginning. You know, it it takes like a solid, in my opinion, like two years before you know you're on it. Cause the first year it's just a bad season, right? Like you're like, Oh, I didn't swim all the season. Like whatever. Yeah. Missed my taper. Exactly. That's what I'm doing right now. Starting. (laughs) Yeah. About 10 years. Exactly. Exactly. So it's not really until the second year happens when you miss it a second time. And then you're like, Oh shit, you know, like this isn't good. So then you, you kind of start figuring it out. So then by like year three, then you're kind of in this like panic mode of like, okay, now what do I do and how do I figure this out? And, um, you know, the, the first time I was on a plateau, I, I, um, I actually switched teams the summer after my junior high school and um, I had a new coach and uh, he had swum at Texas and um, had been on the national team as, in like the late eighties, early nineties. Um, and, and I remember sitting down with him and he was just like, you know, I want you to write out a list 
of what you like about swimming and, and what you don't. And, and obviously, hopefully the list of things you like is longer. Um, but that helped a lot in literally just going through and, and reminding myself of why I was doing it. And, and it was like, no thing is too small. Like you can literally say like, I like the fact that I can eat more after practice, you know, than, you know, I mean, just little tiny things. Like it wasn't like anything is dumb. Um, and so some of it was him, I think, coaching me through it the first time. And, and ultimately what it was, was I had to learn how to have fun and not think about the times or the places, which is really, really hard to do. But when I stopped focusing on the fact that I was swimming slow and I just had fun, eventually it came around. Now, luckily, my freshman year of college helped a lot with that because then I, I, you know, I, I finished high school, I went to college and then your freshman year of college is there's it's such a whirlwind anyways, right? Like you're in a new environment, you have new coaches, you have new team, like new teammates. Um, I had been on very, very small teams up until that point. Like it used to be like me, my coach and my mom would, would go to you know juniors or nationals. So for me, having like 60 teammates was just like the, the coolest thing on the planet. So in a lot of ways, um, that took my mind off of what I was doing. And, and then also college has the beauty of nobody really cares about the times. It's about dual meets and, and just winning the meet. And as long as you win the meet, if you win your race and you do what you're supposed to do, the times kind of don't matter. I mean, they, they do matter from the standpoint that they want you to like get your NCAA cuts. But beyond that, like is once you have your time standard, nobody cares about the, the times again. So I think that helped. And then once I had kind of done it that first time when I had the second plateau, it's like I had to remind myself, OK, what did I do this first time? And and. It's funny because you'll you'll hear interviews where, where David will talk about like, you know, oh, Margaret swam well when she was happy. But like that was really it. Like it sounds so immature, <laughs> but it was just like when I was happy, I swam fast and it was really that simple. And and it was just remembering how do I stay happy? What makes me happy and, and not getting caught up, I think, in some of the other stuff. I'm curious if, if this was at all a factor in what you were telling the college coaches while you were being recruited. Because in 2006, you gave a talk uh, to the like national select camp. <laughs> One of the things you said there was, I love racing. If I could be Gary Hall and never train a day, <laughs> I'd be all over it, but I can't. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I would still do that. I mean, if I could race now like is a 37 year old, I would do it. I mean, I could do that with master swimming, but, but that's the whole thing is I think most, most professional athletes love racing. I do not love training. I have never loved training. Um, when I was younger, I understood that I needed to train and do things that I didn't like to reach my goals. And, and I was okay with that. At the moment, I am okay not racing <laughs> because I don't want to train. Right. So I'm totally okay with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, if there was some way to just magically be good and not have to to, to train, like I would 100% still be racing because that I think that's why every kid starts swimming is and, and not start swimming, but that's why they join swim teams is you enjoy racing. That's the fun thing. But most of us oh, tend to say that you race the hottest race that one can race. Like your race is hell. It's so much pain. <laughs> like, how did you enjoy that? Sorry. <laughs> You know, again, I'm I'm also probably a little bit of a weirdo. Um, I I really like playing like mind games with people, uh. <laughs> and so um, I, so in addition to it being a hard race, like I was a back halfer, and yeah. and I think I think to be a back halfer, you have to like be a little weird. Um, and so <laughs> I don't know. Go like, you. you go. On. <laughs> I thought it was a lot of fun, like screwing with people and the fact that like they would go out really fast and I wouldn't and then I would know that I was going to run them down like I just thought that was so much fun and it wasn't even that like I used to love being in the ready room and you would have these people that were like super intense and like super focused and like they wouldn't want to talk to anybody and I would like intentionally go talk to them and be really bubbly and like hi are you excited <laughs> like just to annoy them because I thought it was funny like I, I mean, it was, I mean, it's really terrible in hindsight, but, um, but yeah, I just kind of liked messing with people because I don't know, like stuff like that doesn't bother me and I don't really get nervous. So I just got a kick out of the fact that like it, it messed with other people. And I was like, really, come on guys. Like, 
It yeah. gave you some very close races, though. Eh? I mean, you, you ran down some people. You got your hand to the wall ahead of some people sometimes, and sometimes not so much, right? Like, that was yeah. running down. Yeah. But that to me, that's the fun of it. Like I think I enjoy I enjoy the race more than I enjoy winning. So yeah. as much as I would like to win, I would rather and, and I, I feel this way about spectating too. I hate blowouts. Like I hate watching a football game where they just destroy the other team. I would rather have a close game and lose any day of the week than just watch a game where they score 50 points ahead of the person. And I, I get bored. I usually honestly don't watch the whole game when we're too far ahead. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go do something else now. Um, but I'll watch it till like, you know, the bitter end when it's close. So I, I felt the same way about racing. I loved close races. What do you think? So besides it being uh, Margaret's on fast when she's happy, what what do you think it was in training? Like, in, what is it in training that made you a great back halfer that enabled you to have the, the like, gamesmanship of <laughs> – in the ready room and that kind of thing like what if, what if, what did you need even if training wasn't like um i mean i don't want to say that i hated training um it wasn't my favorite part of the whole swimming experience um but i didn't hate it i mean there were things that i i enjoyed for sure um i, I think to some extent with with any race whether it's strategy stroke whatever um it, it does pick you, right? Like we would all be sprinters if we could, but you don't decide to be a sprinter. You either are or you aren't. Um, I think it's the same with back halfing, right? Like I naturally was a bit of a back halfer and that's because I have zero front end speed. And when I try to sprint, I slip. So um, so being a back halfer was a little bit natural. And then I think once I figured out that I could do it, it was just learning how to do it well. Um, and that was kind of the constant... Um, that was, you know, that was how, that was what I trained. And, and, and there were several of us, I mean, you know, Bryce Hunt, he swam the tuner back the same way. Kirstie swam the tuner back the same way. Um, so it was nice that there were other people that kind of had the same training style. Um, but yeah, I think it was kind of that constant fine line of how easy can I go without going too easy? Cause then you, you know, you don't, you can't get going at all versus, if I go too hard and for me, there was, it was a definite line. Like if I went too hard, I could visibly feel the not, I could not come back. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just kind of a constant experiment, I guess. Yeah. A lot of people will play around with their pacing and try to figure out what's best for them. And a lot of the research suggests that more of an even pacing or back half is the right strategy. Do you think that is the best strategy overall? Again, I mean, I think it depends on the person. Um, Brian will know exactly who I'm talking about, but we swam with a guy who's a 200 butterflyer and he could only swim it just balls to the wall, fly all, and die. Out, all out fly and die. And there was just absolutely no other option, you know? And, and I think if he had tried, cause I actually do think that he tried other ways. Cause I mean, it, it was honestly a really painful race to watch. Um, but he did it well, you know, and I give the guy a lot of credit because he knew going into it how much pain he was going to be in because he did it like this every time. <laughs> I, I, I don't think he could do it any other way. And uh, and interestingly enough, like I would swim the 200 freestyle and I wasn't a back halfer in my freestyle races. So I think sometimes even when you back half in one stroke, your you know, your strategy will change from stroke to stroke. So I I think it does a little bit depend on the person. We used to call it Josh Davis swims. The yes. other way. Not the back half, but the, the front half. We call it yes, Davis. exactly, exactly. It worked for him. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Luke, you had a question about her catch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a question, Margaret. Um, I, I got to know one of your college teammates because um, he came to turn out, Doug Van Wee. Mm -hmm. And um, Doug's hand entry backstroke was this. He would enter, he would, you can't see it, he'd enter like that, right? Like mm -hmm. at a 90 degree. And I was like, oh, 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 Doug, how are you doing that? And he'll go straight, he'd just be like that. And, and and Doug is a world class backstroke at the time, right? And we know that he was a national team and stuff. Your hand entry is also quite unique, where you enter thumb and it, it was all about getting the catch. I remember as a 13 year old finally understanding what my coach meant like by feel the water and catch the water here because i only felt it a backstroke i was like oh that's what he meant i was 12 or 13 <laughs> and, and it was all about that catch there and, and your catch is so brilliant glenn mills talks about it um when you did a thing with him and, and focuses on it um 
I would love to play a little bit of Glenn Mills talking about your catch with you mm -hmm. on a previous episode of us. And then I would love for you to talk about how you developed your field to backstroke because you have one of the most beautiful backstrokes there is. Um, so I'll, I'll have to play a little bit of Glenn talking about it for a second in a previous okay, episode. Okay, perfect. All right, so. I want to learn why they got to where they got because we, there's a, there's, well, there's not an infinite, but there's 7 billion different uh, physiologies on the planet. And someone's going to find a way to figure that. It, thing it's out. coming. One second. And so, if I work with an Olympian, I want to find out why they came to this point. And it's probably one of the biggest things that that uh, bothers me is in social media. Uh, and I did an interview with Margaret Holzer last week. Another Auburn swimmer. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, but Margaret enters in backstroke with her thumb first. And every time I post a video on social media about Margaret. And uh, she and I had a good laugh about this. Um, everybody says she's horrible. Who, if they don't know who she is, she shouldn't be swimming like that. She needs to fix that. She needs to do this. And, and I spend so much time saying, look, you have to learn from these people. You have to, you have to, no one has a more vested interest in how to go fast than an Olympic athlete who's trying to win a medal. They're going to search for every possible scenario to come up with that thing that makes them special. Okay, I'll, I'll stop there for now, Margaret. But yeah, talk yeah. about that and another episode. Go ahead. Oh, um, yeah, you know, he's so right. Um, every time he does show anything or, or whatever, people totally freak out about it. And they freaked out about it at the time. I mean, even when I was swimming um, and I would switch coaches or have new coaches, it was always a, uh, a learning experience for a new coach or discussion. And um, I think what I ultimately learned was my hip rotates late. Um, and it's interesting because I coach some now and uh, I mostly do private lessons. And it wasn't until I had a, a swimmer who has a very similar stroke to mine that I think I really fully understood why I did it. Mm -hmm. um, but most people, when they rotate, so if you're using your right hand, you rotate and you're entering pinky first and your hip would be down. So that's the most natural position. So I'm the opposite. When I'm in this position with my right arm up, my right hip is still up. So if I'm in this position now with my pinky up, it actually torques your body. So if you put your thumb up, that's more natural. Yeah. And then as you roll, you roll into the pinky. And so my pinky is actually still entering the catch first. It's yeah. just the first thing that hits is the thumb and then it rolls into the catch like that. Um, but people don't see that because all they see is that first initial hit and then they're, they're just looking at the hand. So they don't actually realize the hip is late and I'm rolling into it. Um, and I think it has to do with like how you derive your power. Like Aaron Pearsall does a really great job of talking about how like when he would swim, he would do this like little side crunch. Um, and it's interesting, like I have played around with that and in, in no way, shape or form was, am I remotely successful at doing that? Um, when I swim, I would hit and then I would throw my hip late because that's how I would power my, my um, the top half of my catch and my stroke down. So it's just like I said, it's, it's, I think it's all about how you get your power and, and playing around with things and, and everybody does things differently. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it definitely freaks people out for sure. For sure. Cause it's not, it's, you know, it looks funny. How is your backstroke so beautiful? What, what did you work on? Like, were you a stickler to this? Were you a stickler to like, did you do the can on the hair when you were a kid? Well, I mean, how, why is this, what's, what's your strength? It was, it was so graceful and smooth and a non-swimmer would recognize that, you know, evenness and effortless of, of it. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I, I definitely was a stickler for technique and I, I think this again goes back to being stubborn, but, um, when I was given instructions to do something, I was really, really good at following it. But more importantly, I was really good at following it for a long amount of time, even when the coach wasn't watching or they had told you, um, when I do lessons with kids, I always tell them like, I'm, I'm not going to necessarily improve what you're doing today everything I'm telling you, you have to take that back and do it at practice. Like, I'm not going to be there with you, right? Like this only helps if you remember to do it every single day, the other, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time when you're swimming. Um, and I think that was something I did really well was a coach could tell me something and then I would continue to work on it, you know, 
months on end after the fact. I mean, doesn't mean I didn't need reminders. Of course I did. Um, but generally speaking, um, I was pretty good at that. But I will say um, I had to buy into it. Like I, I've never been good at the whole like do this because I told you so. I ask a lot of questions, which some coaches find threatening. So I had to I would always have to have the coach explain it to me, not because I necessarily doubted why they were doing it. Um, but I come from a long line of engineers. And if I understand the mechanics and the why behind behind the like what I'm doing and why I'm supposed to do it, um, I usually think I can do a better job of doing it. But then I think it just helps the buy in of like, OK, this will make me faster because, you know, whatever. It's good coaching. Margaret, you were technique aside and your technique was gorgeous, but you also had a had a knack for showing up when the spotlight was on. And you didn't win you didn't win every race, but a lot of races you also got your hand on the wall, uh, whether that be for medals or to make an Olympic team. And I mean I couldn't help but reflect on we've talked a, a bit about third places at trials. Um, with with some people on the show, and you know, Haley McGregory was third at trials in the backstrokes twice, in both of them, and mm -hmm. you were in a race to get your hand on the wall for second and make an Olympic team. And um, now, and you went on to make the Olympic team in, in the two back anyway. But it, but and she was third in both of those races. And I was like, what is it? There's some people that show up and get third, and and then there's some people that get it done. And I'm just curious, what it, what is it about technique aside, training aside? Is it the cool mindset? What is it about you that you were able, like made you able to show up in the big moments? Um, I I think again it goes back to racing. I've always loved racing. I mean, even when I was really little, like in summer league. Um, and you know, we would have a mixed relay and I loved racing the boys. Like that was like my favorite event in summer league swimming. And, uh, I, I think some of it is you have to not be afraid of losing. Um, you just have to enjoy the race and accept the fact that sometimes you will lose, but you can't be afraid of going for it and, and being willing to put everything on the line, knowing that, that you might not get the result you want. Um, cause I think some people are afraid that, if they put everything out there and they risk it all and they don't get it, then they're just going to fall apart. And I think you just have to accept that. Um, kind of in the same way with training, it always, I always thought it was interesting when we would show up to practice and people would be like, Oh, is it going to be hard today? And I was like, yeah, of course. Like who are you going to show up to practice? And it's not like, I think when you just show up to practice and you know, it's going to be hard, it's not scary when it's hard. Um, so it's to me, it's the same thing. You just accept the fact that sometimes you're going to lose and it helps you not be afraid to just put everything on the line and go for it. And then, um, but, but yeah, I don't know. Like I said, I, I, I don't get nervous. Um, but I also, again, I think I define nervousness differently. Um, to me, being nervous is a negative emotion. And I, I associate nervousness with like when you know you haven't studied for a test and you're just like, I'm going to fail this math test because I didn't study and I'm not prepared. Um, the feeling that I would get before a race, kind of those those butterflies and, and that heart pounding and, you know, maybe you can't breathe. To me, that's not being nervous. That's your body just preparing you and saying something is about to happen. Right. Like I am getting ready to perform. Um Interestingly enough, this, the same thing still happens like before I speak and clearly speaking is not a physical activity, um, but it's the same physiological response. And so to me, that's just my body saying like it's, it's go time. It's ready to go. And so I think it's learning that that's a natural response and that's not something to be afraid of versus, like I said, I think people associate that negatively. And then the other thing I think, again, I'm very logical if you're at a swim meet, by the time you're at the meet, whether you're prepared or not, there's nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you just got to get on the blocks and you just got to go. Because if, if, if you think about what you haven't done to prepare, well, it's too late. So you might as well just hopefully you have done what you were supposed to do. Um, but you got to just get up and you got to go. Because at that point, you know, <laughs> there's nothing else you can do. So, you know, might as well. Kudos, Margaret. Awesome. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's great. It's such a practical way to go about it and to ease nerves and things like that. And obviously, like Brian was saying, you've had great, great performances, especially at the Olympics. And one thing you mentioned was mixed relays as a kid. And now they're bringing mixed relays to the Olympics, as well as progressing other events. And obviously, there's tons of technological improvements in the sport. One of the most notable ones are the backstroke wedges that you that was your main events was backstroke. How do you feel about these changes and advances? Um, I like some and I don't like some. I'm really sad that I did not get to live in the era of mixed relays. Although honestly, because I'm not a sprinter, I probably wouldn't have gone to do any anyways. Um, I might have at like a college level because I, I, I did get to do the foreign freestyle relay in college. Um, so I was a good freestyler at a college level. Um, but, you know, internationally, I probably wouldn't have gotten to do it anyways. So that would have been fun. Um, the backstroke wedge, I don't like it. I really don't like the backstroke wedge. Um, and the, my main thing there is if you do a backstroke start properly, you won't slip. So I feel like it's cheating. I just feel like we're making the sport easier and we're teaching kids how to not do it properly. Um, so that that's my philosophy there is it's like, you know, like I said, if you do it right, it's it's geometry. It's just angles on a wall and if you if you if you have the right angle with the right amount of pressure you you won't slip so i actually don't like the wedge you see guys that's how i felt about the touch turn and backstroke in the 80s how did turn to flip turn if you did a touch turn properly what's wrong with you <laughs> <laughs> and that's fair that's fair i, I can see that too. yeah well, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I remember, so I, I don't like the wedge on the blocks either, because I think for the same reason, it basically provides an equalizer instead of people that are able to athletically get off of the block in a particular direction. Exactly. But it may not be fair of me, though, because when I first started in Auburn, that was the first time I was consistently on blocks that were really big and long. And that was a, a huge advantage, I mean, over these little short blocks that I trained on in my training pool in high school. They were short and wide and had no grip to them. So I don't know. I, I guess I feel like I sit on both sides of that. But I, I remember being at the Bahamas Nationals once where um, they were taking surf wax and putting it on the touch pad to get some more grip. And you totally needed it because you knew those Colorado touch pads that were oh, yeah. like, last, the, like the white ones. And mm -hmm. you just like, – I mean, oh, yeah. you you get to the big meets with the flat wall, those are a little bit grippier, but we've all yeah. been on those like terrible touch pads too. So I don't know. Did, well, did you curl your toes? Curl them? Well, the thing about backstroke is we're the redheaded stepchildren of swimming regardless. Like you never get to practice starts under any circumstance, regardless of when you're in college or not. Um, because nobody ever takes the time to drop a pad in. So, you know, even when we were at Auburn, I mean, we were very, very, it was rare that we would throw a pad in the water and, and practice starts. Um, so I think everyone is pretty equal from the, the standpoint that nobody gets to train backstroke starts. Um, when I was in college, I curled my toes practicing starts. I didn't in high school. Um, I don't, I think just no one had ever told me to do that. Um, but in high school or sorry, in college, when I would practice starts, I would curl my toes in high school. Um, and actually my entire swimming career, if I didn't have like a really good grippy pad, I I'm a huge advocate of staggering your feet because then if one foot slips, it's very rare that both feet will slip. So at least you get your, you know, you have a one legged start. But the other thing <clears throat> that people don't think about with backstroke starts is for the regular blocks, like they regulate everything known to man about a block. Like they regulate the angle, the width, the height. They don't regulate anything on your handlebars in backstroke. Like, I'm a, I'm 5'11", right? Like, I'm tall. And then you have these guys like Matt Grievers that are like 6'8", or 6'7", or whatever he is. If there is too small of a distance, but or short of a distance between the handlebars and the pool, you're like trying to do a backstroke start like this, right? And, and as a female... I, you don't have the kind of upper body strength that a male has. And I, I need a certain amount of distance to pull myself out of the water because if it's too crunched, like I can't, I can't even do it. Um, and then on top of the fact that there's no regulation on how the bars itself are made. So like in 2004 in Athens, they had a bar like this that had two um, blocks, I guess, coming out of it so when you went to hold um when you went to hold to, to grab the blocks the the thing that was attaching was hitting like right in the center of like my two fingers here where normally they attach from the tops and so I either had to 
offset myself and be like off center or really wide or really narrow because I was going to have this thing in the center of my fingers. So I ended up because I couldn't do a super wide start or a super narrow start. I ended up just being lopsided so that when I did my start, I wasn't in the center of the lane. I was slightly off center, but I'm like, they don't ever think about things like that. And that's why I'm like, we're, we're the redheaded stepchildren. <laughs> I don't know. More than breaststrokers though. Breaststrokers oh. have their own lanes. They're on their own intervals. Then, yeah, I have one more thing to make things worse. <laughs> then, then people think like the bubble in 2008. And what was it called? It wasn't, it was in the bubble, the cube, the whatever cube, the, cube, cube. the water yeah. cube. Yeah. That thing was so hard. The ceiling, there was no, uh, there were no lines on the ceiling to look at. Uh, so like, it's bad enough when we have, <laughs> it's bad enough when we have to swim outside, but then most pools have something on the ceiling for you to look at the cube there. It was like weird squiggly lines. There was no like, there were no beams. Like I literally intentionally tried to get myself in lane six so that I could follow the um, the camera, like the NBC like track camera above it, so that I would just have like a line and something to stare. I did it in, I think it was the hundred. I got myself in lane six, but not in the two hundred. I didn't do it right. I'd love so. to see an analysis of your performance in races where you were in a pool with an optimal straight line in the ceiling versus not. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, in, in 2004 in Athens, it was outside and it's hilarious. Like you can hear the commentating and uh, I'm like hugging the lane line because the only thing I could do is my philosophy was as if I swam next to the lane line, even if I was hitting it, I was it was better to go in a straight line hitting it than to like, you know, ping pong ball, like across the whole thing. Yeah. And, and Rowdy's like commenting and he's like, you know, she's dragging off of the other person and he's making it sound like all professional, like there was a strategy. And I was like, nope. <laughs> Look at that reaction time. Look at I was her just go. trying to go in a straight line because I couldn't see where I was going. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, they... So we've talked about um, different eating, uh, just how, the nuances of when you travel for swimming and saying you have to learn about the pool and you have to like, you have to learn about the other aspects of travel, whether that be controlling your diet, um, your teammates that you're around, being with coaches that aren't your coaches. Mm -hmm. what, is it, what do you remember about like how you would adapt to different meat environments and make sure that you were controlling what you could control in swim paths? Um, you know, it's, it's funny. Um, David used to always say control the controllables. Um, and that was something he would talk about a lot. And, and basically it was control the things you can, can control and don't worry about the rest. And I think that was something I got really good at doing was um, just realizing the things that were within my control and then everything else. You just kind of have to learn how to go with the flow. Um, the coaches were really easy from that standpoint, because even if you're not with your own coach, you know, coaches, right, they give you paper workouts and things like that. So you're still kind of doing your own coaches workout. Um, and you all you you ultimately, th there's such a small pool of coaches that are on the national team, there's maybe like 12 coaches, and they take eight of them. So you know, and they kind of rotate. <laughs> so you get to know the coaches pretty well. Um, so I actually, I think I was on the national team for nine years and I was probably, if, if David wasn't there, I had like maybe two coaches. Like I was in Jack Bowerly's group a lot. Um, and I loved being in Jack's group. Cause I figured, you know, with, with Georgia being Auburn's number one competitor, I was like, if there is any coach on the planet that knows like every split, every tempo I've ever had, like it's Jack, right? Like, you know, he's analyzing what Auburn's doing, just like Eddie would have known all the, the Auburn guys. Right. So uh, I actually loved being in, in, in Jack's um group for that reason because I figured you know he would be the one guy that that knew what I was doing um but yeah you you kind of end up being put with the same person I think kind of consistently um and then like eating like they do a really good job of trying to make things I think is familiar um familiar as they can um so even when you're in like just totally weird environments like they'll have like peanut butter and jelly in the team room and I mean just kind of comfort food um, so you can have sort of like normalized snacks. Fruit snacks were always a big thing. So they, they do a really good job of, of trying to make it work. I'm also not picky at all when it comes to eating. So I just like eating. So I <laughs> I was always pretty okay with that. <laughs> I don't know if this is when you were on the team, but I distinctly remember uh, a SEC championship meet where you have the team room. So like... <laughs> You know, there's always uh, for uh, the big college meets, there's always a room when you're traveling with your team and there's like a hotel room specifically that's got all the food and where you have your meetings. And I remember the fruit snacks, people were just 
take him down with fruit snacks. And I remember having a team meeting where David takes the box of fruit snacks and he was so pissed that everybody was just eating fruit snacks and feeling like it was garbage. And he just takes it and he chucks the box at Miss Diane and says, no more fruit snacks. I wasn't on the team, but I was a post-grad. I was a post-grad and I'm pretty sure I was at the meet. Or that or I heard the story, but I think I might have been at the meet and just like heard about it. Oh, this is one of those things, like, why it's, he just needed to get mad at something, so it was like, the fruit snack, yeah, that, give me that. <laughs> like, but, yeah, David but, didn't get, like, really fired up very often, but when he did, it was really memorable. <laughs> yeah, it really was. I feel like a lot of coaches need that. Um, yeah. Well, so, I want to switch gears uh, fairly significantly and, and move the direction of what's happening in, in your life now, right? And, um, well, we're in quarantine life for sure, but uh, but I did one of the one of the true reasons that um, you know we were talking with Glenn about um, why a conversation with you would be so great and so how what I so admire about you not having you know interacted with you about this during your swimming career is your life that you've built uh, around advocacy and the experiences that you had um, with abuse as a as a young girl and bringing that into to help people now in your life. And I so admire that as a, as a group of guys here on this podcast, we can't know what, you know, your life has been like, but, um, but what I'm curious to, to get your feedback on is, well, the world has changed a lot in, in, in this period of time, even since you started doing this type of work. And, um, and so we're also now in a time where, you know, now it's a focus for USA Swimming to, in quarantine life, when practice life isn't the same, or, um, or you know, the World Health Organization talking about domestic violence, etc. Things to look out mm-hmm. for in different situations. What's on your mind in the body of work that you do now? Like, what is on your mind in this day and age in the sport of swimming and the world in general? Um. It's been really interesting, um, specifically with with quarantining, um, abuse rates are going up. Um, so it's been just trying to get the, the I guess, information out there um, for people to, to kind of know that, unfortunately, um, a lot of abuse does happen in the home. And so people are being stuck at home, um, one, with their abusers. Also, um, kids are on the, you know, online a lot more. And... Um, you know, there's a lot of online predators. And so um, there's a lot of being solicited online more than ever before. Um, but the flip side to that is um, reports are going down um, because reports typically come from like teachers, social workers, coaches, that kind of thing. So the rates are going up, but reporting's going down. So I think when we're out of quarantine, um, the reports will go back up again because the people that are the, the people that make the reports will have access and see kids again. Um, But I think it's just for parents, you know, having those conversations with their kids, knowing that they need to talk to them and and be open. And then also for for any kids that are listening and are in those situations, um, knowing that there's still a lot of resources out there. And there's still, these are, these are organizations that are um, still um, working. You know, these are, these are people that have been working the whole time and, um, you know, are frontline workers. So there's, there's still a lot of uh, information and places you can go. Yeah, I echo that. Um, I spoke to Marissa Watts, and she runs a, a pretty big swim club right now in, in San Jose. And she says the focus now is doing a safe sport training by USA Swimming and, and really educating both parents and, and um, kids together and, um, and talking as families and having conversations as families. Um, mm-hmm. And that's using this time right now. And also knowing the rules that we applied on deck should be also applied for Zoom calls, you know, about not yep. being alone and, and and having recording meetings and all that. Um, so, but she says it's it, what she's really pushed with the team is the conversations and if and is letting kids know and educate them, especially in this environment. So yeah, it resonates. Yeah. Exactly, and you know, it's interesting because I've I've talked to some coaching friends of mine, and I I think there's a, a, a not I don't even want to say a fear, but I think people 
have this nostalgia about the way things, you know, how things were and the relationships that we had with our coaches growing up and that kind of thing. And, and people feel like they can't have those same kind of relationships with the athletes now. And, and the reality is, is I, I don't think that's true. I think you can still have appropriate relationships and you can still have meaningful relationships with athletes. It's just the way you go about it is different. And so you have to change with the times, right? Like when we were growing up, we also didn't have cell phones or I didn't, you might've, um, you know, but there weren't cell phones when I was growing up and I didn't have the internet until I was a senior in high school. So, you know, times have changed. And so with society changing, technology changing, like, the way you have a relationship is also going to change. Um, but I don't think it means that you can't have a meaningful relationship with your coach. It's just everything you have to adapt with society. Um, and so for those of us that remember how we had it, if we're now coaches, we're looking back at, at our experience as a kid. And so I think we're the ones that have a harder time with it. The kids that are kids now, they don't, they didn't experience that, right? Like they only know what's now. So for them, it's not weird to, to have, you know, a meeting with with your with their coach on deck in view of 25 people. Right. Because they never knew that we were able to have private one on one meetings. You know what I mean? Like, so this is their normal. So I think it's it's not normal for us as the adults because we experienced it differently. But it's not abnormal for them, if that makes sense. And and for those of us that aren't devious people and are are coaching for the right reasons and wanting to have meaningful relationship with their athlete for the right reasons. You know, I think it's just adapting and realizing that the, a lot of these things are out to protect coaches too. It's not just to protect the athletes. Like we're, we're trying to protect the good coaches as well. Like we're, we're trying to get rid of the bad coaches. Um, a lot of these measures are, are actually meant to protect good coaches. And I think sometimes they feel like they're just being attacked and all these, these rules are making their lives more difficult, but in a lot of ways it's, it's actually there to protect them as well. Definitely. My, my wife coaches 13, 14 year olds. And it's interesting to see, like you said, my perspective when I swam and seeing what's happening and, and just how things have changed so much where she, she do challenges at 8 a.m. every day. Why? Because 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. is the time when coaches are supposed to talk with kids because mm-hmm. they are setting these different rules to have, you know, set standards to protect, like you said, not only swimmers, but coaches. <laughs> of all the changes that they're making, are there any that you feel like could be pushed a little bit more? Um, off the top of my head, I don't have anything. I mean, I'm sure there are. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I, I think in general, it's it's always going to be, I think, hardest for the young coaches. You know, just mm-hmm. just getting comfortable with the fact that this is an uncomfortable topic, right? Like, I, I feel like your your coaches that are seasoned coaches um, that are parents, like it's hard to phase a parent. Right. Like they've heard it all. Like they've they've wiped dirty diapers and dirty butts. And like, you know what I mean? Like you're not going to phase a a, a coach who's been around for a while. But like you start talking about like periods and tampons with like a 22 year old guy coach who's in his first season, like he's going to freak out. So I think it's it's taking an uncomfortable topic. You know, sexual abuse is uncomfortable for people in in its in any format, Um, even with seasoned coaches. And it's it's just getting them. I don't want to say comfortable, but it's, it's the fact of the matter is, is, is coaches are going to be the safe place. A lot of times, if you have an athlete, especially if they're being abused at home, they can't go to their parents if that's who their abuser is. So you as the coach might be the safe place. So if, if, you know, especially if you're a guy coach, right? Like if, if, if you freak out over a tampon, that girl's not going to come to you and say, Hey, you know, my dad's sexually abusing me at home. So you have to be able to create that space where the, the athlete knows that they can come and talk to you. And I think, like I said, I think our coaches that are a little bit older have that maturity. And so I think it's the younger coaches, male and female both, um, that it's just they have to know that that, that really is a big responsibility um, because the kids do look up to them, right? And and they do look at these are people that I can trust and I can come and talk to. And and in a lot of ways, those are going to be the coaches they probably feel more comfortable talking to, right? Like they're, they're not, they're going to be terrified of, of the head coach of the team, you know, like, I mean, my freshman year, everybody was terrified of David, you know, like they were way more likely if they had something to go to like the grad assistant, who's a few years older than them, than they were to go to like the head coach of the team. So I think a lot of times the assistant coaches don't realize what an impact they they make and, and kind of how powerful they are and, and and really that they might actually be the easier person to go talk to. Margaret, I got an international question. 
Well, being the international one here, the Caribbean, the Caribbean, Trinidad, and it. Well, we're there, and I saw a lot of in the 90s, big time. Right? And, we're um, and, what? Well, uh, we'll ask your video okay. for just a second. Yeah. Uh, I I'm think sorry, you're good I'm, now. I was just going to bring it back to international and the Caribbean here, um, because I saw a lot of stuff growing up in the Caribbean in the 80s and 90s. Um, and, and when I came to start coaching in the States in 06, um, there's a lot of processes and policies and, and learning that I, 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 um, I benefited from about how to coach and how to be with the athletes and stuff. Um, and also at the same time, I saw a lot of things happening here that I was like, oh my God, it's happening here in San Jose. It's happening here at the school as that. It was mind blowing too. My question to you is, is how, how has, how has FINA and in, in overall internationally done any more steps have they had? Or what has US swimming go, gone abroad to other countries? Um, how have you worked with your international colleagues that you've had over the years? I mean, has it gone beyond the state? So now are we helping other countries? Um, I think we are. Um, you know, interestingly enough, USA Swimming, when we were starting our safe sport program, um, we actually looked to uh, British Swimming a lot because um, they were years ahead of us. And so um, we reached out to, I don't remember the, the name of the lady who was in charge, um, but she came over and, and sat down with USA Swimming and helped us a lot. Um, and so we more, uh, we modeled our safe sport program a lot. So in terms of having like the safe sport advocates like on teams and, and LSCs having a space, safe sport rep, like all of that was taken from British Swimming. Um, they call it something different, but they have like a safe sport person for teams, LSCs, you know, all of their, their groups. Um, so I think it is something that, that people work with each other. Um, I don't know specifically how much they've reached out to FINA directly. Um, mm -hmm. But I think people individually, whether or not they're just talking amongst each other, like British Swimming, USA Swimming, or, you know, whoever, um, I think people do talk and communicate with each other and, and, and are working on it for sure. Um, Margaret, I did want to ask about your, uh, I guess, what's the advice to, not necessarily just from USA Swimming's point of view, but I mean, we're talking specifically about sports and we talk about swimming here on this podcast, but it's really just about what's going on in people's lives. And um, I guess, how does, how does that train outside of the, outside of the swimming pool, if the teachings take place there, if that's a safe place, you know, that's, that's one aspect of, of life, but um, what are you, what are some of the messages that you're talking about to groups about life outside of sport or of swimming? Um, I, I mean, I think in general, so most of the speaking I do at this point is, is specifically on sexual abuse. Um, I do occasionally speak to swim teams or, or, or do what I like to call generically motivational speaking. Um, but, um, I, I think in general, um, swimming teaches a lot of good life lessons that are very applicable and um, I think it's just, you know, working hard. Um, you, you know, you learn how to work together in a team. You learn how to work hard. Um, you learn how to be ridiculously stubborn, you know, and or dedicated to things. And, um, and just that, you know, life's not always going to be easy. I think that's the biggest thing, like whether or not you have plateaus and you have to stick with it. And, you know, I think um, everything that people have been going through recently with the coronavirus, you know, people are, are missing their graduations and they're missing prom and they're missing these really important things. And not to downplay that and say that that's not important, but I think in 10 years from now, people are going to realize that, that that wasn't the worst thing in, in the entire world that ever happened to them. Right. And it's it's realizing that people are a lot stronger than they think they are. Yes. Is it difficult to stay at home for two months? Of course it is. But like there's a lot of harder things than staying at home for two months. Um, so I think it's interesting that, that people can learn what their strengths are and learn what they can handle and, and test themselves. Um, and ultimately just, you know, realize that, that they are stronger than they think they can. And, and when they really want to do something, they can. That's great. Um, okay. So we're going to change gears uh, now, bring Justin back in and we're going to, uh, go through a few rapid fire questions. Perfect. And so let me get these up. All righty. Nothing too crazy, but first thing that comes to your mind. You ready? And Luke, no butting in and adding an hour story with these. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we, so Margaret, we already led the witness a little bit on this, but what's the hardest race in swimming? 
Oh, for me, um, for me, it's got to be the two hundred breaststroke. <laughs> we said swimming. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> not in potato sack racing. If we're talking Gary Hall, um, <laughs> what's the uh, what's your favorite meal? What was your favorite meal after morning practice? Uh, three egg omelet with whatever I had in my kitchen in it. Sounds good. Are nose clips a form of cheating? No, but I didn't. I didn't like wearing one. Uh, so you you set a world record. Would you rather have had Olympic gold medal or a world record? World record, hands down. Wow, and I said that I said that before I broke my world record too. I got interviewed and I said that before. I like it. Uh, what was your least favorite station and circuit? Towel hang. <laughs> yeah, and noose towel hang allegedly was happening my freshman year. Okay, the most common reaction you get when you tell people you're from Alabama. Um, do you, where, wherever I live, other than Alabama, do you like living here better? <laughs> uh, name someone who motivated you. Um, Tracy Hawkins. Good one. How long until a woman goes under two minutes in the long course two back? Probably not that long. I would have said forever until, you know, the last, like, what couple two years so probably not that long now missy and reagan yeah if if you could pick one competitor that you relished in beating who would it be i mean i never made things personal so i i don't even want to say because i i honestly like to me when you stand behind the blocks it, it i want to be whoever i'm racing it doesn't really matter who it is it's not personal I'm just wondering who you're flicking with the rubber band in the ready room. <laughs> okay, so last one. If Beijing got postponed when you were there in your prime, what would you have done? I would have been disappointed, but I would have kept training and just, you know, I would have I would have used the fact that it would have freaked everybody else out to my advantage. That's awesome. Yeah. I think there's a whole lot of people out there right now trying to, I mean, I think obviously this has already been out and people have processed it. Right. But um, I'm excited to, to see what happens in the year post, especially the folks that seem to be like they were really peaking. And I sort of hope that, you know, that, that that's what we see next year as well. It'll change things for sure. But um, yeah, it seems to me like you're the type of the mentality that that would have been just all right. And you could roll with it. So yeah, thank you, thank you so much for sharing some insights with us and for spending this time with us. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this episode of the social kick podcast. Um, this is great. And, and we'll see you guys next week. Cheers. Thanks everybody. Thank Cheers, everyone. Thanks for joining us.